All right, looks like everybody's getting logged in. Well, hopefully you're enjoying the sunshine today. Beautiful fall Michigan day, absolutely love it. So basically, Authenticine has been around for many, many years, but it recently received a uh, facelift, if you will, and it's now 60% faster. Um, it also has high resolution documents. So what that means is if you get an offer, a lot of times when you get those offers and you scan them in, uh, those documents were unfortunately kind of fuzzy, maybe a little bit distorted and a little bit hard, harder to do a counter offer on. Uh, what you'll notice now is those documents are crisp and clear, they're high resolution, and so it certainly makes it a whole lot better. So I'm gonna turn my fuzzy hair off today and uh, that way you can just see the actual screen here and you should be able to see the Authenticine screen at this point. And we're gonna shift over into what is new with Authenticine 2.0. So first and foremost, as we go through today, my name is Colleen DeLang, a little bit about me. Uh, I have been a licensed Realtor now for 22 years. And I also am full time at the My Real Source staff. And so uh, previously I had worked at a forms company and an e-signature company. So I probably know a little bit more about digital forms and e-signatures than most. So excited to take you through what's new in Authenticign and show you some time saving tips and techniques as we go through Transaction Desk too. All right, so first, um, in Authenticine, you're gonna notice that the 2.0 version of Authenticine is going to look differently. However, all the same great functionality is there. Instead of opening each panel in Authenticine, as you used to have to do, you now can do everything from a main dashboard that's already open. So you can add participants, you can add documents, you can set up tagging, or even use the layouts all from one screen. Before, it was on one screen, but you had to open each section, which was very cumbersome and wasn't quite as efficient as we'd hoped. So in the new Authenticine 2.0, what you'll, some of the new functionality that you'll notice on this page is that you can actually edit a signing name in real time. So what exactly does that mean? Well, let's say that you're sending out your documents to Joe Schmageggy. And Joe Schmageggy, you have his name spelled wrong. You've already sent the documents out. You can now actually correct that name without having to cancel the envelope, go back, make the changes, and then resend everything. You can actually change his name up until the point he signs. Um, the other thing is you'll find that there are some uh, new tools and new ways to adjust your layouts. One of my favorite features, though, is that a signer, if they decline to sign, can now leave a reason. So let's say you sent the docs to an attorney to review before. If the attorney rejected the docs in the reviewer role, you would have to pick up the phone, call the attorney and ask, OK, why? what didn't you like about these contracts? Now they can actually leave feedback right in the rejection that says, oh, the closing date was wrong or the name is spelled incorrect or something along those lines. Some of the others, uh, as I mentioned, the docs are now um, going to be crisper and clearer. Even if you're bringing in outside documents, they're going to be high resolution docs. And you can set up layouts that are customized to a role. So some really cool functionality that they've added, obviously, to make this even better. The new Streamline UI is going to look like this, but we're going to go all through it today. I find that some of the markup tools are even easier to use. I know previously, if you tried to use the freehand or the drawing tool, it was a little finicky. Sometimes if you got that line a little small, it was hard to move around and get it in the right place. You now can do counter offers much easier. And those drawing tools, I think, are much more efficient. Of course, this will work on tablets phones, um, a, a traditional a PC or a Mac, it will open up to your screen size. And one of my favorite things that they've done is that they've eliminated that additional step of your clients having to go in and do that second complete box. I absolutely hated that because many times if your clients had their resolution set too large, if they had their screen blown up basically, it was very hard to see that second complete box. So they actually got away from that. Now, right on the uh, opening section of the document, it will say you can use a pre-generated font to sign this 
or you can draw your own signature, or you can upload your own digital signature if they've done that as well. So it's made it much easier, I think, on the client side. Again, if you are sending this to someone and they do decide to reject the document or not to sign the document, then the good news is now they can actually tell you why. So you don't have that additional step of having to pick up the phone and ask them, well, you know, why are you rejecting this document? You can actually see it right from what they send you. So those are some of the enhancements. Of course, we're going to go over all of that live. If you've just joined us, remember that you can ask questions at any time today. Simply just type them into the questions box. And if you would prefer to ask your question, there is that raise hand icon that you can click on at any time, and it will alert me you have a question you want to ask to the group. All right, so let's get to the good stuff. I am all about time-saving tips and techniques. What can make it faster? How do we make it easier? So I'm gonna give you some of those right now. If you are brand new to Transaction Desk, or if you're coming over from another MLS who, uh, there's some MLSs in the area that aren't carrying Transaction Desk anymore. So if you're coming over to our Transaction Desk, the good news is you will not lose any of your files. We will move those for you so that you don't miss a beat in your, in your business. I know, especially coming back from the pandemic and starting to sell a lot more, the last thing we want to do is learn new software. And the last thing we want to have to do is try to recreate those form files that we already had in play. If you are new to Transaction Desk, the hardest part of Transaction Desk is really, in my opinion, knowing where to start. If you are on the buy side, uh, if you are working with the buyer, think of it this way. You really always want to start from the MLS. So I'm going to just call on some people in our, our call today, and we're going to use Dave this morning. So Dave, I believe it's Donahoe. I hope I'm sp spelling that or saying that right. Dave is joining us, and we're going to pretend that this is Dave's $3 million listing. Congratulations, Dave. I never seem to get in this price point, so way to go. But we're going to pretend that we are working with a buyer. You just showed Dave's $3 million listing, and you are now ready to write an offer. The last thing you want to do is go into a forms program, have to pick a bunch of forms, and then rekey all the information that's already in the MLS for the property you just showed, right? I don't want to have to go in and put in who D uh, Dave works for, what brokerage, what's his license number, what's the address, what's the school district, all of that is right in front of you. So if you simply click the blue icon that you see right here that says start a transaction, it's actually the Instanet icon, just so you know. If you click on that, it's going to pull 90% of what you need for all of your purchase contracts directly into your offer to purchase and all of the forms you need when you're working with a buyer. I find the house, show the house. I now want to write the offer. This, consider this your easy button. Once I click the easy button, the idea is it's going to pull all the information from where it already exists in the MLS and it's going to allow me to just fill in some basic information like my buyer's contact information and how much my buyer wants to pay. And it's going to fill out 90 percent of everything else for me. So let's take a look. The first time saving tip and technique I can give you is if your brokerage has not already set up a template, you definitely want to do so. So you want to have basically your listing packet or your sales packet or maybe your lease packet already set up. Now for me, I have a brokerage template, but I noticed there were a few forms in my broker template that I don't use that often. So you can also make your own template and sort of streamline that. So in this case, because I'm working with the buyer, I want to go in and I want to apply my buyer packet. Okay, so the address is already here. The MLS number is already here. The last thing I want to do is I want to make sure that I am listed as the selling agent because we know Dave already listed the property. So therefore, I'm going to be the selling side. So it knows where to fill in my contact information, my license number, my brokerage information, and so on. Now, of course, if Dave is writing this up and he's double dipping the file, well, then we're going to go ahead and we're going to say, okay, he's doing both sides. Or if it's a transaction coordinator, maybe they're representing neither side. So all you're going to do is basically tell Transaction Desk who you are and who you're representing in the transaction. So in this case, I'm going to say that I am 
the selling agent, and I'm going to now create my transaction. So basically behind the scenes, what it's done is it's saying, okay, because you used the easy button, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna pull all that information that already exists in the MLS right into your transaction forms. Now, I'm gonna go through the wizard, but keep in mind, once you use the wizard a couple times, you may just wanna do everything from the convenient dashboard. It's completely up to you. But let's walk through the wizard just a, uh, for a moment so I can kind of show you the layout. If you're new to Transaction Desk, remember this. The wizard will give you, you can see how much auto population is already starting to take place, but the generic wizard will give you a chance to really fill most information out so that everything auto populates appropriately right into all the purchase side contracts. So because I click the easy button in the MLS, you can see things like the street number, street name, city, county, subdivision, tax number, school district, MLS number, lengthy legal description, all of that is carrying over for you. Down below, it's gonna bring over MLS information. But remember, this wizard is generic. So I can see that most of the listing information has been filled out by the listing agent, our friend Dave on the call today. However, now I wanna go in and fill out what does that buyer wanna pay? So I'm gonna say, okay, I know that buyer is gonna offer not the three million, um, but he's gonna offer two eight. If there's a deposit, an EMD deposit, you can put that in here. If there is um, a counter offer and you want to offer an additional EMD, you can do that here. The only one I don't personally fill out in the um, a dashboard that you see here is the total financing. And that's just because at my brokerage, a lot of times we'll, we'll put in percentages if we're doing like an FHA or a VA. And this actually calls for an actual dollar amount. So generally, that's the only thing I don't fill out on the wizard. But here's another time-saving tip and technique. If you go over to the left-hand side where the listing information is, if you take the time to say, okay, we're gonna ask for the stove and the built-in microwave and the washer and dryer. If you put those in the inclusion area, it will actually carry that over to all of the contracts that ask you what you want to include. Maybe you have something you wanted excluded, like um, maybe there was a uh, play structure in the backyard and you wanted that removed. You could actually add that into the inclusion to the exclusions and it will carry that over to your contracts. So even though it says it's the listing side, don't be afraid to put additional information in, like what you want the property to include, because you'll find it keeps you from having to fill that same information out on multiple documents later. Okay, I'm gonna jump over to step two. Step two deals with the dates. So obviously, uh, if we're putting in an offer, we wanna date it maybe for today, uh, maybe we're giving them 48 hours to counter the offer. So you can actually go in and you can fill out the dates. But keep in mind, if you're an advanced user, you may want to use the dates for something a little more advanced. Now, for today's class, we're going to kind of keep it down the middle of the road, right? Because we have some people who are newer to technology. We have some people who are you know, extremely advanced. So today we're kind of going to go middle of the road. But keep in mind, if you're a more advanced user, you can also use these dates to send automated reminders to yourself or your team. So for instance, if you uh, are always going to put a lockbox every time you list a property, well, it's a really good idea, especially if someone else on your team is going to be in charge of adding the lockbox to the listing, you can use the tasks which are driven off of the dates that you're entering. So if you're brand new to technology or brand new to Transaction Desk, you may just wanna fill in the dates so the contracts are filled out with dates, and that's totally fine. If you are a little more advanced user or on a team and trying to automate things, then that's where you may wanna use the tasks that you see over here to the right. I'm gonna say, I'm just gonna show you one kind of briefly just so you kind of get the idea. I'm gonna say on every listing I take that I do in fact want to um, make sure that the sign gets installed or that the lockbox gets installed, we're gonna use sign. So I'm gonna say install the sign. 
And now you could give it a due date, but really everything in real estate is driven off of something else that happens generally in the transaction. So there's a few different options. You could say related to a transaction date, or you could say related to another task being completed. So in this case, I'm gonna say that I wanna make sure that my sign is installed two days after my list date. Do I want the reminder? Absolutely, I want that one day reminder. And if you have somebody on your team, you can share this task to that someone on your team. So in this case, I'm gonna say Colleen DeLang is in charge of putting up my sign. I'm gonna go ahead and hit save. And now my task is created. And you can make these tasks mandatory so that they're automatically applied to every single file. So again, if you're not looking to automate the system, you don't have to take it that far. For me, I simply love it because it just keeps me on track and I don't miss any crucial steps. All right, so I'm gonna jump back to where we were. So remember that um, when you're in the wizard, it's generic. That first step is really just the details of the transaction, right? It's, you know, what you're filling out, what you're auto-populating directly from the MLS. That second step is really just what's the offer date? What are the dates that you want to appear on your contract forms? All right, the next step is the most important step. So if you remember nothing else, remember that this step, if you do this properly, it will fill out 90% of the information for you. And it will also allow you to, when you go into AuthentiSign 2.0, it'll allow all the tagging to be set up for you, which I love. So I don't have to go in and tag where each buyer is supposed to sign, where each seller is supposed to sign. It will do that as long as you complete this step. So of course, it's bringing over who listed the property. It's bringing over who's selling the property. It's bringing over the brokerage information. But now we need to add our contact information. Oh, and it looks like we have a question. Oh, good question, Jeremy. Okay. Do tasks send emails to the team members to notify them of their task? Absolutely. Um, when, you, when your transaction desk account gets set up, your email should already be there, but you can go into preferences and add it. And yes, it does send an automated reminder and you can even make them required so that they have to complete them um, so that it closes that task for you. So yes, Jeremy, the answer to your question, a very good question. Does it send email reminders to the person responsible for the task? Absolutely. And it will also send um, email reminders when the task is completed too. Good question. Okay, so next on this step, this is again, the, in my opinion, this is one of the most important steps to save yourself time. You wanna go in and simply add in the contacts for this transaction. So I'm gonna say, I want to, you could add yourself, but remember we already do that at the MLS for you. You could add people from your Google contacts. You could add someone you worked with before, but in this case, we're gonna make it nice and easy today. We're going to create a new transaction contact. This is the most important step in the contact. What is the role? Now, of course you can fill different, um, if you're working with a certain referral network and you wanna keep track of it, you can actually add them to the dropdown in your preferences. But the most important one really is your buyers, your sellers, your attorneys. You wanna make sure that you have those roles in this dropdown. Now, when you go in the first time, buyer, seller, attorneys, a lot of these are already here. So I wanna select that we're working with Barry Buyer. And I wanna obviously put in Barry Buyer's email address. And I'm gonna show you why. I'm gonna put my email address in just to show you the signing process. But obviously you wanna put your buyer's first name, your buyer's last name and their email address. And then um, you can, there's also a place if you wanna put an address, things like that. But for me, I generally just put in first name, last name and email address. However, if it is a power of attorney or a trustee 
or maybe they're signing on behalf of a corporation, that's actually what these three lines below. Now for, for the normal buyer, this is really all you have to fill out and it's gonna work perfectly for you. But again, if you have an attorney who wants it spelled out that Barry uh, buyer is signing as a trustee, for the trust of la la la, you can actually type that in here and that's what will be pre-printed below the signature line. Uh, recently I had an attorney, he was, <laughs> he actually wanted the, underneath the signature line, Barry Beyer is signing on behalf of the trust for Ed Holmberg from the trust and the trust date. So it was this huge long um, signature underneath and then he wanted them to actually sign that way so you can actually set up their signature to be different and basically you're only going to use these three lines if it's a trust a corporation or a power of attorney and they are signing in a different way than their contact name is going to read so again 90 percent of the time you'll probably never need to to use that, but just in case you're working uh, you know, on a trust, a power of attorney or corporation, I do like to show that it's here so that you can adjust that signing name and make it easy for them to sign. For Barry Buyer here, we're gonna pretend that he is our only buyer. We're gonna go ahead and hit save. Immediately, you can see Barry Buyer's been added to our list. Obviously, if, there were, if Barry was also married, maybe I would put in uh, Mrs. Barry Buyer um, and add in that second contact. All right, so pretty easy. Next, we're gonna go ahead and we're going to, and, and this part, I have to be honest, I thought was a little bit tricky when I first got into this program. Uh, when I got my license 22 years ago, I remember forms and documents were really referred to kind of as the same thing. Oh, you got forms, you got documents, they were kind of the same. So in my mind, um, forms and documents have always been the same. However, in Transaction Desk, they are different. And let me explain. Forms are anything that is a filled, a fillable form that Instanet has created. So basically, when you go into Transaction Desk and you um, grab forms to fill out, I'm just going to click on a preview, there where you can fill the information into blank forms, that's considered a form. So now I was thinking, well, okay, so what's a document? Because again, I kind of thought they were the same thing. But as you go forward, there's also the document step. Now, documents refers to anything outside that you wanna bring in. So things like your copy of your EMD check, your pre-title, um, your, let's say you have um, a filled out home warranty that you wanna have in your file. That's considered a document. So just to be clear, the forms are anything that you go into Instanet and you can grab from the library and choose to use. Documents, are gonna be anything that you're bringing in that's outside of what's already created in Instanet. So hopefully that helps kind of clear up what the difference is, because I kind of thought that was a little confusing. When you're on the form step, what you should notice at this point is all the forms that my brokerage requires have automatically fallen into my transaction. So I don't have to go look for 10 forms. And as you can see, my brokerage has a lot of forms. I don't have to go look for these. They actually just fall into my transaction automatically because I have that package set up or my broker set up that package. Again, you can set up your own packages. I'm gonna show you how to do that today. So you may wanna create your own listing package or your own sales package, and that's totally fine. Now I'm gonna share with you, I have a little OCD, so I'm also very particular of how I like my forms and what order I like them in. So for me, I really always like my agency disclosure to be the very first form that they see. I just learned it kind of old school and it just always stuck with me. So I always like that to be the very first form that when they're signing, they see. One, it's very simple. It explains what I do um, and it's just, always really good to have that i think on the on the open of your signing so for me i just drag and drop those forms into the order now if you set up your packet the way you want it it will automatically drop in that way um, but my broker had my purchase agreement on top so i like to just make sure that i move my disclosure to the uh, the first order if you're looking at the form and you're like mm, is that the form I'm thinking of because sometimes you know you've got you know multiple different buyer agencies you're not exactly sure what form you're looking for you can always go over to the menu dots at the right you can do a preview 
and you can actually see the form to ensure, yep, that was the one I was looking for, okay? Another thing that you can do right here is if there is a particular form that you don't see, let's see, let's say you're selling a home and it has a swimming pool and you want the swimming pool addendum. You can simply go to the ad at the top of the page and that will open up all of the libraries that are available to you. Now, I'm gonna be honest, I think the libraries are a complete overkill. You've got like 10,000 forms in here. I am never going to go through all of these to try to find the swimming pool addendum I want. I'm simply gonna type in a keyword like pool. As soon as I type that keyword into the search box, it narrows down all the, out of all those 10,000 forms that you have access to, it's finding all of the ones that have pool in the title. So really easy for me to say, oh yeah, I want to use my swimming pool addendum from my company and add it in. Okay, and so again, you can add multiple forms in. However, if you have your packet always ready to go, it makes it so much easier, I promise. All right, so now let's jump over to the documents section. We did something about uh, two years ago that I absolutely love. It saves a tremendous amount of time. And to my knowledge, I believe we are the only MLS who has done this uh, for us and our data sharing partners. Um, what we do is when you are starting on the purchase side, okay, so let me just jump back to what we did. We started on the purchase side. We clicked that easy button. That easy button knows that right over here, there is associated docs. As you can see, the associated docs are where agents put in their um, feature sheets sometimes, maybe a survey of the property, uh, maybe they've got their seller's disclosures and lead-based paint documents there. The idea is before we would have to go in and we would have to download each one of these because we wanna send these over to our buyer to sign with their buyer contracts, right? So you'd have to go in, download them, then pull them all into Transaction Desk, and it was really a huge waste of time. So what we do for you now is when you click that button, we automatically pull those in for you. So let me show you. So Tom's, uh, or in this case, Dave's seller's disclosure that he filled out with his clients automatically came over from Paragon because my buyer's, of course, going to need to sign that. So that he's, you know, we can say he reviewed it. He knows the condition of the home. So automatically, anything that's in the associated docs within Paragon is migrated over into the document section for you. So right here, I can see, oh, yeah, here's that seller's disclosure statement. If I click on that, I can now view the disclosure statement filled out by that homeowner and I can send it along with my purchase docs so they can sign everything at once. I don't have to keep piecemealing all these different pieces of the transaction. One other thing that Transaction Desk does, now I have to be honest, I think faxing is going away. I don't know anybody who faxes anything anymore, but I will tell you there's a cool feature. That I don't use it for what it's intended for, but hopefully this little tip will help you down the road. Every single transaction that's created in Transaction Desk has an automated fax cover sheet. Now again, no one faxes anymore, so you don't really use it for faxing, but here's what it's good for. Let's pretend for just a moment that you just got back from your closing, you've got that big closing, some title companies unfortunately still give you paper, and you've now got this big closing package. But I like to have that in my file, so when I close the file out, everything is there. If, if they call me and wanna list their home a year later, I have everything. So this fax fact cover sheet is actually specific to this transaction. So if you actually scroll down in your fax cover sheet, you will notice that it says 205 Lakeshore here. That's because anything that is accompanying this fax cover sheet will be deposited directly into that transaction for me. So here's kind of how it works. By the way, you can also email this, but I'm just showing you fax wise. If you go, um, to a fax machine, you've got that ugly closing package. You don't want to have to scan it, wait for it to load, move it onto your computer from your email. Then you got to go and put it in transaction desk. Oh, I want to cut out all those steps. I basically want to fax my package, my closing package to the number that's here. 
And this barcode will ensure that it shows up in the appropriate transaction and it will even email you a confirmation that it's there. So if you have a bunch of documents that you didn't add to the file and you don't want to wait and scan them all, what I suggest is simply use this fax back cover sheet, fax it directly into the transaction. You'll get an email with a link that will come right to your phone or your email so you can see that it's there and you can even review it. Okay, so I love that. Um, again, documents are where you're going to bring in anything outside of what Transaction Desk already has prepared for you. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to say we've got a home warranty form and we want to pull that in. All we're going to do is click on the plus and it's going to open a drag and drop strip. And basically, you can add up to 20 files at one time. So a lot of times I'll have like, you know, pictures and uh, my forms saved on my desktop in a file. You can actually just drag all of them in onto this blue bar. Let me quickly see if I can grab one here. All right, I'm gonna pretend for a moment that although it says my Thanksgiving invitation here, we're actually gonna pretend that uh, this is, uh, I don't know, home warranty form. We're gonna grab that, drag it onto the drag and drop strip, Simply let go and you can see how quickly that was just added to my documents file. Again, you can add up to 20 at one time. If you're not comfortable with the drag and drop, I, I had a lady in my class yesterday who said, I don't, I don't know how to do that. How do I just get it from my computer? I know how to do that. Well, if you'd rather get it from your computer, just simply click on the blue strip and it will actually open up your computer and you could go ahead and pull in things that way. So if I have like, here's my trail side listing here. If I wanna go in and pull documents from my trail side, again, even if you wanted to do two or three of them, just grab them, drag them over to that drag and drop strip. And you can see immediately those documents are now added at the bottom of my documents list. So really easy to bring in those outside documents. I think easier than it's ever been. All right, so we have our forms, we have our documents added, and then the last step is really, I'm just gonna hit done, and it's gonna take me to my transaction dashboard. Now, I know what you're probably thinking, lady with the fuzzy hair, we haven't seen one single form yet, so how do we see the forms? Well, what I like to do is I like to have you set up your dashboard so that you can do all of those same things right from what we just did in the wizard. And if you do this one little step right here, it will also deposit all of the signed documents right back into the transaction for you. So when you're ready to see, let's say they call you to list their home, you sold it to them two years ago, I can go right into this AuthentiSign box. I can see all of their signed documents. I can see things like their closing package. I can see everything and it's automatically sent back to the transaction for you. So it just saves a lot of time from having to find and piecemeal a lot of stuff together. So what, I'm gonna be honest, um, the people who created Transaction Desk, they give you a dashboard that I personally did not find helpful at all. Um, and so let me show you what I mean. When I am using my dashboard and I want to add a new person, a contact or a new form, I want to be able to do it all from one screen. I don't always want to have to use that long wizard. So I want to have all the important boxes right on my dashboard. So just a moment ago, when we were going through the wizard and we added our very buyer, you saw that I clicked on create new transaction contact and it brought us to this screen but I don't wanna to have to use the wizard each time to do that. So I want that same capability right on my dashboard. So really easy to do. You're gonna click the unlock and it's gonna give you all of the options. Now, one that Transaction Desk gives you is this checklist option. If so far in my, uh, gosh, what have I been teaching this, seven years, I have never seen anyone actually use the checklist. So having the checklist in the dashboard, not that helpful. So if there's something you don't want in the dashboard, click the X, remove it, but do make sure you have things like AuthentiSign, forms, documents, and contacts on your dashboard. So again, if you wanna add it, you're just going to grab the box at the top, drop it onto your dashboard, and then, of course, you can make these boxes larger or smaller. You can move them around in any order that you want. 
just remember when you're all done, let me go ahead and take that stupid checklist one out again. Just remember when you're all done, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and lock it back up. That way those don't shift around for you for future. So once I recommend, have your overview, contacts, forms, documents, and AuthentiSign. Those ones I think are a must because I want to see everything for this transaction right on that convenient dashboard. All right, so let's go in and let's take a look at some of the forms. So let, we're going to jump over to, uh, I know I added quite a few in here, but we're going to jump over to our purchase agreement. There we go. And we'll talk about filling out the forms. So if you've done a good job at filling out the information in the wizard, most of everything you need should be filled into your purchase contracts at this point. So for instance, if you can see the MLS number, the brokerage who listed it, the listing agent, the listing agent ID, the email for the listing agent, the phone number, the property address, the legal description, all of that is carrying over. Um, as I mentioned, if you added inclusions right here, stove, microwave, washer and dryer have all carried over because I took the time to fill that into my wizard. Up here at the top, of course, you can, uh, it does auto save every 30 seconds, but you can go in and make changes and save them. You can copy forms, and I always get the same question here. Um, why would you ever copy a form, Colleen? Well, most times I don't, but sometimes you copy addendums. Um, you know, you've already created one, it's got the address, it's got the date. Um, you might want to add an additional item into the addendum, but really the only form I've ever used this copy on is the seller's net. So I love the seller's net in Transaction Desk because it auto calculates everything for me so I don't have to always do the math. Um, but when I'm going on a listing appointment, I generally do three seller's net outs. I do one on a high side, one on a lower side, and then one where I recommend so they can kind of see the difference in the numbers. So a lot of times if I've taken the time to fill out the seller's net, I simply copy it over because let's face it, your home warranty is probably not going to change. Um, a lot of those fees do stay the same. And then I can just go in and tweak things like maybe the commission, the transfer tax, things like that, so that they can quickly see. And, you know, the address and everything I really need is already there. OK, you could, of course, watermark if you're doing a draft. Maybe you're doing a draft counter to send to a buyer. You can go ahead and watermark your contract. You can remove a form, uh, you can print it. Obviously you can send it via email, via fax. We're gonna talk about document markups in just a moment. Um, so all of this is available right under the file tab. Another one um, that I really recommend, especially if you are a broker, is setting up your company clauses. And a lot of people don't know how to do this. So I'm gonna show you real quick. Um, company clauses are really great if you're like me and your broker says, you know what, Colleen, don't create your own legal language, just use what I have in the library. So there are certain times that I, you know, I'll put together maybe concession language and it looks really good. Another time I might go in and be struggling with how to exactly say what I'm looking for. So if you are a broker, I do recommend setting up company clauses for your agents to use. So let me kind of show you how it works. Um, let's say that I am trying to find some language for seller concessions. I can go to my clauses, which can be done on an office level or a personal level. And I'm going to say, OK, I want to use my uh, you could set up different folders, by the way, home warranty clauses, home inspection clauses, seller concession clauses, whatever you want it to be. And maybe I want to say that all the appliances are to stay with the home and we're asking for, uh, or maybe I wanna point out that the buyer has seven to 10 days to do a home inspection and all results must be in writing, whatever it happens to be, I'm simply gonna go down my list and select the clause I'm looking for. I hit okay, and it's now going to import those clauses directly into my contract. Um, and a uh, couple of them, like concessions, I actually have blank lines where I can just fill them in. So it's really easy to just simply apply the clauses. It's very nice if you do this on a brokerage level because then agents don't have to come up with their own legal language. Okay. Now, most of the time, and, and by the way, there's, there's some other options here, but they're pretty self-explanatory. Um, most of the time, when you are working with a 
counter offer, there's you or when you receive an offer, let's say, let's say Dave sent us all on this call an offer. Most of the time there's a counter offer involved. So the question then becomes, okay, how do I counter that within transaction desk? How do I make that easy so my clients can sign it and we've countered it and it's all put together? So really that's gonna be done in the documents area generally. So again, if you, uh, let me jump back to the dashboard just so it looks familiar for you. And again, you could do it right from uh, the dashboard or you could do it from the wizard, whatever's easiest for you. But obviously you're gonna wanna go in and you're gonna want to, if they emailed you the offer or you've scanned in the offer, you're gonna drag that offer onto that blue line. And now we're gonna start working with that offer. So in this case, we're going to pretend we are countering. Uh, let's see what would be a good one. Um, let's use this one. We're just going to pretend we're, we're countering a particular document. So when you're countering documents, and this is more of a feature sheet, but if you're countering a particular document, you're literally just grabbing that offer and you're sending it into um, your documents, because remember, that's something you're bringing in. That's not something that's not a form. It's already created. I'm going to use my purchase agreement over here just because it's going to show a little bit better. Um, when you're countering a particular document, you want to go up to the painter's palette or the little markup here. Um, that painter palette is basically your PDF tools, just like you see in most programs. So let's say that, um, you know, Dave is, he's listed this great property and he's asking the three million for it, um, but maybe we're going to counter that price. Actually, I put 28 million, so that would be a really good day for Tom. We're gonna go ahead, we're going to use our tools under that markup and we're gonna simply cross off and initial if we were marking something off. So let's say we're not going to include the washer or dryer. We're gonna go up to those markup tools. We're gonna to cross off the washer and the dryer. Now check with your brokerage on your policy for crossing things off. Um, I was just teaching up at an association the other day and they don't allow any cross offs. Everything has to be done on a separate addendum. So check with your broker on your policy. For my brokerage, we can cross off. We just have to have everyone in the transaction initial. Um, but you know, check with your broker, see what your policy is. If you are countering a price, well, that obviously really isn't gonna work for us, right? We wanna put the new price in there. So we're gonna go up to the markup tools, but this time we're going to use the text box. I'm going to, and I like to create the text box kind of in a general blank area. And I'm gonna say, okay, uh, we're countering at 3 million. Gosh, I wish I could get in that price range myself, but um, I'm gonna go ahead and counter this at 3 million. Now, I guess if I just lay that on top, well, you can't even read that. That's really no good to anybody, right? So if I'm, especially if I'm changing an offer I previously made. So really what I would wanna do is I would right click and change this from transparent to white. So it now has a solid background. You could change the font size. You could make it bold. Um, again, maybe I want to make this font just a little bit bigger. Um, some of the Detroit contracts are very, very small, so sometimes you have to make those a little smaller. But what it allows you to do is adjust your box and now lay it over the top so that it's the exact text and font just like that. So again, you can make it um, transparent, um, you can make it solid, and then you can lay it or trans basically transpose it right onto that other number. So again, if you don't want to cross something out, and I did a cross out here, but I'm just going to go ahead and remove that so you can kind of see it a little bit better. If you don't want to cross something out, remember that solid transparency can be laid right on top to make a nice clean document for you. All right, and there's quite a few different ones. There is if maybe you want to point out you got a home warranty for them, you can actually use the markup tool to highlight um, there's a strikeout tool. So if you wanted to strike off that, no, we are not uh, going to remove the curtains and you can even change the color. So if you want it to be in red, you could do that too. So a bunch of different tools that are really set up um, for going in and countering those, those documents that you've brought in. So if someone sends you an offer, very easy to counter that right from here. 
Um, another feature that I absolutely love is the document slicer feature. And let me kind of explain what that is. So I am constantly on the road. I'm driving to different associations. Um, I still sell. So every once in a while, um, I will send my buyer all of the documents, like his buyer's agency. Um, I will send uh, the buyer agreement, which has truly confidential information like his phone number, his address, what he's looking for. But I have him sign generally everything all at one time. And now when he is signing them, they're basically in this big PDF, right? But I want to turn it around and I want to send it to Dave so that he has it right away and can present it to his sellers. But if it's all in one big PDF, how do I get those confidential documents out? Um, and so let me let me show you that next. So we will um, I'm use our purchase agreement here. We're going to use the document slicer. So the document slicer is on a bunch of different pages in Transaction Desk. I showed you the markup tools, which are kind of like the painter's palette. You can see we mark this document up. But the one next to it, which looks like a page with two pages ripped out, is the document slicer tool. And it's really cool if you are using the app and you want to slice a page off or slice a form off so it doesn't go to the, the co-oping agent. Here's all you have to do. Let's pretend that these last two pages are my buyer's agency. And I do not want the listing agent to see those because it's got confidential information just between me and the buyer. But the buyer signed all of the documents together. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to select the pages I do want to make a new PDF of that I now can slice the other ones off and I can now send it to the co-oping agent. So here's what you do. Simply highlight the pages that you now want to send to the co-oping agent. Hit save. And I always like to do a save as because I always like the original to be there. I like to have a paper trail so I can see, okay, here's where we started. This was the second counter. I, can, I always want that paper trail. So I want to do a save as the pages I selected. And I'm going to call this counter offer or Dave. So there we go. And I'm going to go ahead and now hit save. And basically what it does is it takes those that seven page document down to the five that I've selected that now I can go ahead and I can email them uh, directly to that other agent. OK, so if I go back to my documents here. I want to show you how quick it is to email these things out too. If I go back to my documents, anything that I want to email out, any counters that I've done, um, anything I want to email out separately, I'm just going to go ahead and select, go to my basket, and I'm going to go ahead and you could fax them, you could email them, you could print them. What do you want to do with them? So really easy. Um, again, the whole key is really just going to the documents section and being able to quickly email them out to that, that co-oping agent without pages you didn't mean to include. So hopefully, hopefully that makes sense. Um, again, you can actually do this uh, directly from the uh, right-hand side and you can go right to documents, or if you go back to your dashboard, you'll see all of those documents located there too. All right, so hopefully that, that was a good tour of the buy side. So as I mentioned, the hardest part of Transaction Desk is where you start on the buy side is different than where you start on the selling side. So just to kind of recap, on the buy side, you've already showed the property. It's already um, you know right here in, and you showed it. Now I want to click the easy button, the little blue splash, and I want to now pull that into Transaction Desk. On the buy side, you're always going to start within Paragon. But on the listing side, how do you know that that agent put all the information in correctly? How do you know that legal description is correct? So really, I don't want to start from an agent entry. I really want to start from the tax record or the municipality record, right? So I'm going to go over to Add. And I'm going to show you a little trick here. So I'm going to say that I'm taking a new listing at 41539. Actually, I just closed this, but uh, 41539 Wessel. 
And um, some people do like to put the um, client name in there. I don't like to put like Bob Smith because if Bob Smith buys and sells a couple houses, it's hard to find which house I'm looking for. So what I would do is if you like to have the client name, that's great. Do something like the address and then Bob Smith because then it's easy to see um, exactly which house you're looking for, which transaction you're looking for. So obviously if I'm doing, if I'm creating a listing, I want to apply my listing packet. Now here's where it got a little tricky. So Brian, who I just adore, he's our um, chief information or chief technology officer. He writes code, he's just a brilliant guy. Um, I love working with him, but he's never sold a house in his life. So when he showed me this new feature, I was kind of like, huh? So he was saying, you know, hey, this is really great. You can import the data and you can actually fill all your listing contracts out. Um, you just go to the drop down, click on real list, and then put in the tax ID. And I went, huh, where do you get the tax ID? Oh, well, you gotta go look it up. Well, that's not very helpful. Agents don't memorize tax IDs. Um, we memorize addresses. So he's like, oh yeah, that makes sense. So instead of doing that, instead of having to go look up the tax ID to pull it from the tax record, here's a little cheat, but it's gotta be exactly like this. So let me show you. In the drop down where it says import the data, you don't want to import from Paragon or the MLS, so you're going to choose the second option, which is real list or tax data. I'm going to click on real list, and then I'm going to go right over here to the magnifying glass. That magnifying glass keeps you from having to look up the tax ID. What it's going to do is it's going to ask you to fill out, and by the way, please only fill out these three fields because I promise you, it's kind of like Google. The more information you put in, the less amount of results you're going to get. So what I'm saying is if you just fill in the county, which is in this case, it's Macomb, the street number, and then the root street name, which in this case will be Wessel. Now it's actually Wessel Drive, but you wanna leave off the drives, the ways, the places, you wanna leave all of that off because it's very specific. Tax records are very specific. And if you spell out the word drive and the tax record is DR period, it's not going to pull it. So you only want to put in these three exact fields, the county, the street number, and the root street name. Leave off the avenues, the ways, the circles, the places, the drives. I promise you, you'll always get an error because it has to be exact. Once you put in just those three fields, you're gonna go ahead and click search the tax data. Immediately, you can see it brought up that record. I'm gonna now go in and check it off. I'm going to hit select. And you can see it's now plugged in that tax ID for me. I hit create and it's gonna start auto-populating all of that into my listing forms. But it does some other cool stuff too. Not only is it going to pull the tax information to fill out the lengthy legal description, the county, the city, the address, not only is it gonna pull all that information in, but it's going to look and pull in those sellers of record too. So if it's a husband and wife who actually um, own the property, both of them will come over into the contracts, but they'll also be listed as the seller. And you're probably thinking, well, what's so great about that? Well, when you're getting ready to have your seller sign those documents, they'll be tagged where all of the sellers should sign. So here's our first step. As you can see, it's bringing in the year built, the school district, the tax number, the lengthy legal description, the you know subdivision, zip code, all that stuff. But if we jump over to step three, it's also brought in the seller. You can see it's labeled the seller's name, and our documents will now be auto-tagged where that seller is supposed to sign. So it just makes it so much easier to, than having to fill that all out and go in and tag all those documents. All right, so let's jump over to another cool thing that we did, um, at least I really like this, and that is the My Real Source data sheet. Now, I have to be honest, there are kind of different setups at each office. Some offices, the admins put the listings in. I have OCD, so I like to do it myself because then I know it's correct. 
Um, but I don't want to fill all this in and then have to turn it into an admin to check and then rekey information in. I, I one time had a listing. It was a vacant land. It was 47000 And unfortunately, the admin was very busy answering the phone, doing a lot. And it went in at 470000 So and it was certainly not worth that. Um, so a lot of times, if you will just take the time to fill out the data sheet within Transaction Desk, all of the red is obviously required but right up here there is a cool function called the listing upload if you take the time to fill out the required information and click that button it will actually send your listing information to paragon and create a partial listing now some mls's just push it into a full listing now i don't like that and i'm going to tell you why if you push it to a full listing at this stage, it takes all of the text and it puts it out on Zillow and Trulia and, and Realtor.com and all of these places within just a few moments. Unfortunately, because it's text, there are no photos added yet. And how photos work is because photos are high resolution. Many places like Zillow and Realtor.com only pull those high resolution because they're big files. They slow things down. They only pull them every 24 to 48 hours. That means technically you could have your new great listing out there for 48 hours before it has any photos. And that would be not good. Some unhappy sellers would be uh, calling you. So what we do is a little different. We push all the information to the MLS for you, but we create a partial listing. So you're probably thinking, well, what do you do then? If we create a partial listing, one, if your admins are in charge of putting in your listings or checking them over before they go live, they can see your partial listing under office listings. So you can say, OK, um, uh, secretary, I've put in uh, 3064 Oak Ridge Manor. They can open it up and actually make it live on your behalf. Or for me, I can simply open that listing, add in my photos, then I can hit save and my listing is live. So the idea is it pushes it over into a partial status. I now can go in, add my tweaks, like maybe my disclosures, maybe my listing photos, hit save, and my listing is live with the photos before it goes out to any of those IDX sites. Okay, so that's kind of why we built ours a little different. And we actually did that on purpose to make sure agents were adding their photos first or that your admin could look at them and then it could go live. So it kind of gives you that chance to add those photos and any additional pieces at that point. There's one more function in Transaction Desk, which I uh, I love because I am that agent who will go on the listing appointment. I used to push the seller's disclosure in front of them. And then you know what would happen? Almost inevitably, they would start filling it out. They would realize, oh, wait, there's this NA column uh, and uh, that means not applicable. And I should have been choosing that one instead. I picked, uh, no, it wasn't available. So these seller's disclosures generally take a little bit of time for the seller to fill out. Or I will go measure the rooms and I'll come back and they're discussing, where's the warranty for the roof? Let's find that, let's write that on there. You know, and it just becomes kind of um, time consuming. If you're the agent who wants to get home and start cooking dinner um, and you don't wanna have to come back and get it a different day, here's a little tip. You can actually send the seller's disclosure ahead and have the seller fill it out from their email. So let me show you how it's done. The seller's disclosure is generally never, and it's never supposed to be, filled out by the agent. So there's really no reason we would be filling this form out, right? This is going to go to the seller and it's the seller's responsibility to fill it out. So what I wanna do is I want to send this in an email to that seller so that they can fill everything out and it automatically comes back to me. So I'm gonna say I want to send this via email. And by the way, I would really only do this for the actual seller's disclosure. Maybe the lead-based paint um, would be another one, but really everything else I would never do this for because we create those documents for them. We don't want them really filling anything in. Um, but in this particular case, the seller's disclosure is always filled out by them specifically. So I'm gonna say, I'm gonna send this to Sally Seller. 
And I'm going to put Sally Sellers email address in here. And you could put a personalized subject line like um, looking forward to our listing appointment tomorrow, whatever you want to say. And of course, I'm going to send this as a link, but I'm going to do one more thing. I'm going to send it in an editable format. So I'm going to say, okay, when they get this, they can now fill it out. Maybe I want them to fill it out before our listing appointment on Friday. So I can even put an expiration date in here. Now, what's going to happen is this is going to then send it in an unlocked format so that they can go ahead and fill it out directly from their email. So I'm going to show you that in just a second. The idea is it takes about 30 seconds for them to receive it. But when they open that form up and start filling it in, when they hit save, you're also going to get an email as the agent letting them know, letting you know that they filled out that form. So I'm going to go ahead and open up my email real quick to kind of show you what they see, because I I always kind of worry, you know, are my clients going to find it easy because I don't want to scare them, you know, and if it looks hard. So um, I'm just going to show you what they see when they receive your email. Now, first and foremost, the email comes from you because let's face it, if it came from AuthentiSign, they're not going to know who that is. If it came from Transaction Desk, they don't know who that is. So it has to come from you and your email address. So that's what they're going to see here. Um, my company branding, of course, is at the top. And my contact information is included right in the email in case they have any questions. There are some basic instructions here that just tell them to click open the document and they can start filling it out. When they open the document, they're going to be able to go in. You can see it's very streamlined. They can only they can change the font. They can print it or save it. So not hard on their end. They can go in. They can fill in the boxes if they make a mistake like they're oh, this should have been N.A. I can actually change. They can change the mistake. Um, they can go in and fill out the fields. Um, so everything is open to them. All they have to do now is save it. They can, of course, save it as a PDF. They could print it. But as soon as they save that form, look at the bottom of my screen. It just sent me, the agent, a notification that Sally has opened up the form and saved it. So this notification is telling me, the agent, that that form is now back in my transaction desk file and I can see everything that they filled out. Now, of course, I can print it out, take it to my listing appointment, or I can send it with the other docs to be e-signed. Um, so the idea is they can fill it out even before I get there, which I have to tell you a few times has been really nice for me um, because then I can actually, if I see, oh my gosh, yeah, they had mold in the basement, um, I can address that right at the listing appointment too. All right, looks like we've got some questions. Good, good. Um, can we edit and change if they make a mistake? Really good question. It is a live link. Um, so what you would do is you would, yes, they can um, edit or change it. And what would happen is it comes back to you um, and then you, it's a live link, which means it saves all the changes that they put on there before they hit save. You then can open it. But if you see that there is a mistake or they, you know, it's something sounds a little scary and you want it to be a little more clarified, you can actually resend it and it will resend it as they filled it out. Um, so very good question. So just to just to kind of clarify the question, Jeremy asked a really good question. Um, if there's a change that needs to be made or there's a mistake on it, can you basically resend it out and make that change? And the answer is absolutely. It is a live link. So when you're sending it again, it will show everything that they've filled out on it up to that point, and then they can go ahead and modify it, change it, or uh, you know, if they've made a complete mistake, they can actually even start over. So really good question. And feel free to keep those questions coming. Uh, remember, in the right-hand side of your screen, minimized, uh, you will find the GoToWebinar questions box. You can type your question in, and then we can go ahead and address it. Thank you, Jeremy. Good questions. I love it. And it lets me know that you guys are out there and, and following along. So, OK, so um, talked about the um, listing side. We talked about the purchase side. 
Um, and I showed you a couple time saving tips and techniques of making it work a little smoother for you. But the one that I keep telling you is most important is definitely setting up your packages, set up your listing package, set up your sales package. Um, and how to do that is going to be right under your preferences or these gears along the side over here. So if you go down into your transaction desk account, you'll see these gears. You're going to click on those gears and you're going to go into your preferences. The top one is just basically your user information. Don't change that because that's really coming over from the MLS. So nothing you need to do there. The um, information for your office, that's already there. But if you're new to Transaction Desk, you do want to make sure you have a signature line in there. I just copied mine right from my email and plugged it right into my email signature. But you do also want to make sure that you've added your branding in. Make sure you've got your banner, which shows up at the top of your email and faxes and, uh, you know, when your clients are receiving things from you, your company logo and your personal photo. Now, be careful. Don't screw these up, because if you put your photo here, I had this really, really nice lady contact me and she sent me a thank you email right from Instant, which I thought was so nice. Except, unfortunately, she had put her photo in as the banner. So when I got her email, it was like six inches of just her forehead. So don't do that. You want to make sure that you've got your personal photo in that middle one and then your banner here at the top and then your logo down below. All right. So that's really under your preferences. The other thing you can do under these settings is, as I mentioned, you can create your clauses or you can create your packets, which are called transaction templates. You click on transaction templates. You'll love how easy this is, I promise. Um, if you are a broker, you can create them for the entire office. So as you can see right here by the um, by my uh, KWL buyer packet, this is for the entire office. And you know that because it's got two entities here. Ones that you create on your own will just show a single entity. And you know that that's only being seen by you. So when you're ready to start your packet, you're going to click on add. I'm going to create this personally so all of my office doesn't see it. And I'm going to call it Colleen's Listing Packet. Actually, we're going to call this Jeremy's Listing Packet because he's been so helpful today. And then what do you want this to be applied to? Well, I'm going to say my residential listings. And you can even put in a brief description. That's really it. Once you hit save, you've named your transaction template. The hardest part is adding the forms or documents that you want to be part of it. So Jeremy's going to go down and he's going to click on the add form section. And he's just going to decide what do you want to be part of your listing packet. So let's say that he wants to add in that great My Real Source data form. He's going to go to the My Real Source library. He's going to say, OK, I want to add in that cool data sheet so that um, I can make my listings go live right away. Um, maybe you're using, um, let's say maybe you're using the seller's disclosure from the Michigan Association of Realtors. So then I'm going to go down to the Michigan Realtors library and I'm going to say, oh, I want that seller's disclosure. There we go. I also want maybe the lead based paint disclosure from here. So I'm going to find that. And check that. And then all I'm going to do is add those three forms directly to my forms here. And of course, you can drag and drop them into any order that you want. If you have an outside form, maybe you have an office turn in sheet or a checklist for your office. You can even go in, do that same drag and drop process. You can put them in separate folders if you want. But I'm going to say, yep, I want to use this for my turn in sheet and you can add those documents into. So it makes it really easy. There's nothing else you have to do. You don't even have to save this. That's how good it is. It auto saves once you create the title um, and it then ensures that every time an agent applies that packet, they have all the required forms that you've set up. Now brokers, if you, we have a couple brokers on this call today, you can also require documents. I don't, I don't know if I really love having the required documents always. I mean, there's certain things that, yes, should be required. Sometimes it can be a little bit more, um, 
you know, if you're requiring like a pool of denim, it doesn't have a pool that can be a little a little sketchy. So if you are creating packets, you want to make sure that the required forms are ones that have to be turned in on most every deal. Um, so hopefully that helps, too. So we've talked about templates. We've talked about setting up your account. How about talking about what we're all really here for, the new Authentisign 2.0. The new Authentisign is how your clients are going to get these documents and how they're going to sign them. So we've done all the hard work. Let me jump back here. We've done all the hard work. We created the forms. Now we want to send them over and get our clients to sign them. If you follow this one simple step, you will save yourself hours and hours of tagging and frustration. So that step is when you are getting ready to send your documents for signature, you want to remember, even though it says optional, don't even think of it as optional, you want to remember what the clients are signing needs to be linked to the transaction. So let me show you what I mean. The signings, when I start a signing, I want to click on the pen over here to the left. Now, let me be very clear that right now, there are two versions of AuthentiSign running. Okay, so the classic version, if I click on that classic tab, I can see everything that up to the new version coming out that I created. If I click on the new tab, that's going to show me everything I've now done in AuthentiSign 2.0. On November 18th, this classic tab is going to is basically going to go away and everything that is in classic will go into read only so it'll still be in your transactions it'll still be there you can still see it under signings but these this old version is built very differently as i mentioned the new version is 60 percent faster and so what will happen is these will turn into read only's or archives and they'll be in your transactions they'll still be available but you'll only see the new AuthentiSign 2.0, okay? So remember, as of November 18th, this will turn into just the new AuthentiSign. So what I'm telling you is if you are using the old AuthentiSign, start using the new because the time is ticking and you want to get familiar with it. Um, from here, that important step I keep referring to, you're going to click on Add to start assigning, and I want to start it in, of course, the new AuthentiSign. But where this says optional right here, please don't think of it as optional. You want to marry the signing you're about to create to the file it belongs to. So when you come here, you're going to see all of the files. And I want to say, yep, this is my purchase agreement for 205 Lakeshore. I wish I was selling that property. All right. So got my purchase agreement for 205 Lakeshore. I've married it to the file. I know it says optional, but just disregard that. You want to make sure you're doing this important step. If you don't, I promise your signings are going to take a long time. If you do this, it'll be a series of clicks and your documents will be signed. So let me show you. We're going to go ahead. We're going to hit save. And everything now is laid out on one screen. You don't have to expand things like you did previously. So basically, everything over here is what we're is is options. So who are you sending it to? That's obviously our first option. I could go in and add myself. I but we did all that. Remember, we did the hard work on this. That's why this part is so cool. All I'm going to do is pull my contacts from the transaction. So Barry Buyer, who you saw me add earlier. Here he is. Uh, Colleen DeLang, the selling agent. Here she is. Tom Lipinski, our listing agent, who we pretended was Dave. Here he is. The other thing that I think sometimes confuses people is if you are sending it to your side of the transaction only, or maybe you're just sending it to a husband and wife who are your buyers, or maybe just two sellers, and you're working just that one side of the transaction. Well, then I really don't care who gets it first, right? The, the, the husband or the wife, they could equally open it and sign it at any time. However, if you are also including the co-oping agent, you would never want to do that, right? What if you sent the co-oping agent the purchase agreement before it was signed by the buyer? That would be horrible. So what you'd want to do is you'd want to adjust your signing order because I wanted to follow the logical order of real estate. OK, so again, if you are just sending it to a husband and wife, 
that you are representing, you don't care who signs it first, then you can just leave it as is. However, if you are doing the logical order of real estate, and by the way, I actually just do this all the time, I always have it set so that there is a signing order so I can track it, I can see who signed it, and I can make sure it's going in the logical order of real estate to ensure it doesn't end up at the co-oping agent before my buyer signed it. There's another thing here too, and again, I'm not gonna go too far into this because everybody can be at a different technology level, um, but let's pretend, because Jeremy has been so wonderful today, let's pretend that um, Jeremy is the listing agent. And I'm going to pretend that I am the selling agent. And I call Jeremy and I say, you know what, Jeremy, um, I am going to offer full price. I'm really hoping we can get this done today. We're not asking for anything. Can you just get your clients to sign? Jeremy says, absolutely. Send it on over. I can actually send it to my buyer. I can witness because at, at my firm, we do witness our contracts. I can send it to Jeremy in a private participant role which means Jeremy can review it, and if he likes it, he can actually add his seller's email addresses and names, and we can actually go full circle without anyone having to touch it again. Meaning if I just sent it to Jeremy with my buyer's signature on it, he now has to take that, pull it into his AuthentiSign, and he has to tag it up for his sellers to sign, right? I would only do this if you have a complete, you know, you already know you have a meeting of the minds because most of the time there is a counter offer. So things are going to need to be changed. But if you know for sure that you have a complete meeting of the minds and you want to eliminate the extra tagging for that other party, you can actually do a private participant role too so that the other agent has the keys to have his seller's information and email address added, and it will all be tagged so that they can sign immediately. So it's a little more advanced, but it's actually a really cool feature too. All right, so in this case, I'm gonna say I'm sending it to my buyer, I'm going to witness the contract, and then I want it to go directly over to the co-oping agent. There's one more thing on this screen, 90% of the time you'll never need to change it, but there are three different ways that you can add a signer in. A remote signer is just someone who's getting it in an email and they're signing it either with their fingertip or their mouse or they're signing it on their screen. They're basically getting it in the form of an email and they're signing, really easy. The second one is the reviewer role. And what that means is if there's an attorney who says, well, before you send it to my client, I wanna review the documents first. That's fine, you wanna send it in the reviewer role because it will come to that party first and even though they're not signing the document, it will ask them to accept or reject the document. That means that there is a timestamp that the attorney did in fact review the document. And so that's really important because now I have that history of yes, the attorney did review it on this and this day with this, and with this time. Um, I also had a, a really sweet girl. She had just turned 21 years old and her dad had uh, bought a few houses with me. And she said to me, she was just buying her first little starter home. And she said, you know what, Colleen, this makes me nervous. Just send everything to my dad. Let him sign it. And I said, well, no, we can't really do that. In, and she was going to be out of town as well. Um, I said, why don't we do this? Why don't we send it to your dad in the reviewer role? That'll show you that he read it and accepted or rejected it. When he does that, it will automatically go on to you and then you can sign it. And she's like, oh yeah, that's great. As long as he sees it, I'm great with that. So that reviewer role basically is capturing that person accepting or rejecting it. If the attorney rejects it, they now can actually leave why they're rejecting it. It stops the flow. It does not go on to the client now. And it alerts you immediately via email why that document was rejected by that attorney. So it's kind of a cool feature. That is something they just recently added, by the way. Then the CC role, and a lot of people get this confused with like a CC on an email. This is completely different. The CC role is really set up for title companies or lenders or parties that you want to have the documents if they're all signed. So the CC role in AuthentiSign works like this. If I said that uh, Barry Beyer and Colleen DeLang were going to be signing these documents, if both of those parties signed the documents, 
that CC role will deliver it to a title company or a third party with my personal message, but only if all the parties have signed it. So if you don't have a deal, there's really no reason to send it over to the lender, right? So I want that, I want the signed documents to then accompany it to the lender or the title company, or maybe your office admin. Um, again, it can contain a personalized message just from you that only they see, but it's a way to ensure that once the deal is coming together, it's now delivered to those next parties. So in today's case, we're just going to do remote signers here. We're going to say they're both going to get in an email. They're both going to sign. Now, because I've selected the signing order, I can, of course, drag and drop them into the order that I want them to sign. And I'm just going to caution you here. I had just a really, really nice lady in a previous class. She was a little bit older. She was struggling with technology a little bit. Um, but she was writing her first deal after the class. And she said, you know, if I have any problems, can I call you? And I said, oh, absolutely. So I'm driving home. She calls me on my cell phone and she says, I am so embarrassed. I have sent this to my buyer 12 times. He's not getting it. I'm, I'm just he's going to know I'm new and I'm just really embarrassed. Can you help me? She's actually getting very teary on the phone. So I literally pulled over, hot spotted my uh, phone uh, to my computer so that I could actually look and see what was going on. What had happened was she had made herself the first party, right? And then her two buyers were next. Remember, this goes in an order, though. So because she had never opened her email and signed it, it could never go to the additional parties. So remember, you want to make sure you're putting this in the order that you want the signings to go in. I personally always like it to be my buyer. And then I like to witness my contracts afterward, just making sure that I've you know, dotted all my I's and have all my initials in the right place before sending it to the co-oping agent. So again, you can put them in whatever order you wish. Now let's talk about adding our forms and documents. But remember, we already did that hard step. We did it way back in Transaction Desk. So when I click add a form or document, really I'm going through my file and just deciding, okay, what do I want to have them sign? Obviously my purchase agreement, my buyer's agency, whatever it is that they're signing. But by the way, here's the cool part. Remember how Tom's seller had filled out the seller's disclosure in Paragon, that's here too. Because remember how I said it bundles them all together for you? So now they can sign those documents. They can see the feature sheet. I can include everything on the signing docs. It's all here in the list. But what if you have something, uh, let's say a copy of your pre-approval letter just got emailed to you? You can add additional things by clicking the upload, works the same way. You can go drag something onto that drag and drop strip right there. And I can load that into the signing docs too. So we're going to talk, we're going to talk about these layouts in just a minute. So I'm going to skip over that. So remember, very easy to add additional documents. Um, all you're going to do is you're going to go to that documents area. You're going to click add and it's going to allow you to add those additional forms. There's one more thing and I, uh, it took me a little while to understand why you would use this. So I kind of want to explain it because I think it is very cool. Of course, you can pull from your file. Everything's here. Of course, you can add outside documents. Pretty easy. Just showed you that. But what was the my files for? And then I had my I had a deal diet inspection recently and I'm like, oh, I totally get this now. So I wanted to share it with you. The my files section is let's pretend for a moment and Jeremy, since you've been so nice, I'm going to use you again, um, that Jeremy Turpin is um, working with a buyer. That buyer, is, they're buying 123 Main Street. Uh, they have the home inspection. And unfortunately, they decide, you know what, it, we're not going to go through with the sale. There's just too much work that needs to be done. So Jeremy really doesn't want to get rid of 123 Main Street because he wants the paper trail. He wants the history, right, of what happened in case there's ever a legal situation. So Jeremy's a great agent. He goes out the next day. He finds him an even better house. They love it even more. But as Jeremy creates 456 West Street, he realizes that the copy of the EMD is still in 123 Main Street. His buyer's agency is still in 123 Main Street. His, a lot of the things that he needs for this file are in the other file. 
So Jeremy doesn't want to have to reprint those out, scan them in, now re-pull them into another file. No, he just wants to go to the My File section. He wants to go into the documents and he basically wants to go into another transaction and he wants to copy the EMD into this file. Maybe he also wants to copy the buyer's agency. He's not going to have them re-sign that. They already signed it, right? So I'm going to go ahead. I'm just basically copying them into this new file too. So hopefully that makes sense. The my files is if you do have a deal that dies, don't just delete that deal. You want to be able to pull those pieces. A lot of people will say, I just rename it. Well, but then how do you have that history, right, of what happened in that transaction? So I tell people just copy them over. Now I have those additional pieces in the appropriate file. So now really all that's left is tagging the documents where the signatures need to be. But as I mentioned, if you're using the local association forms um, like GMAR, Gross Point, um, the Michigan Association of Realtor forms that you saw me add, those are actually all tagged for you. So it's going to know exactly where the buyer and sellers are going to be signing. If you are using company specific forms, your brokers can actually tag those. But if they haven't, and I grabbed mine so I can kind of show you. All you're gonna do is you're going to click on the tools and you're gonna to go to the area where the signing is gonna happen and you're gonna drag and drop the signing into place. Okay, my buyer, Barry Buyer over here, I'm gonna grab a signature line, gonna drag and drop it into place. Now, when this first came out, one of the things that absolutely made me crazy was that every time I applied an initial, the date and time were next to the initial. Okay, I never on my contracts anywhere have where I need the date and time next to the initial. So if that is a frustration for you, let me show you because it really certainly was for me. Um, let me go back up to my purchase agreement so you can see it. If I'm dragging on initial boxes, like as you see on my purchase agreement, it doesn't call for a time and date here. So it just basically looks really messy. And as I mentioned, if you have OCD like I do, that's really aggravating. So every time I was applying them, it was basically looking like this. And it was making me crazy. Um, so my initial, my date, his name was underneath and the timestamp was underneath. And I'm like, oh my God, that looks hideous. So if you just simply double click on the uh, signature square here, you can actually choose what you want to be there. So I just wanted the initial. So I took all these other, I turned the toggles off. Um, of course, you can scale it to be larger or smaller to fit in that area. And then you can save it as the default for that party. So that means anytime I'm using buyer initials on my purchase agreement, it's gonna know that that's all I need is the initial. I don't want all this other stuff. It was just getting in my way. Um, so keep in mind when you're using the tools, you can actually just drag and drop them the exact way that you want, okay? So of course there's a sign here, initial. If you want to open up a text box, you could do that so they could fill something in. I generally try to always have it filled in. It just makes it that much easier. If you make a mistake, um, you can always click on the garbage can underneath and remove it. But as you can see, and particularly on this contract that you're looking at, my purchase agreement is seven pages with my company. And I, if I have a husband and wife that are buying this home, I would have to go in, put Barry Buyer's initials, then change it to Sally Seller, seller then I gotta put Sally Seller's initials here, and then I, so I'm doing this for each one of the pages and what a pain in the neck that is. So you can actually click on initial pages, and you can say, okay, my buyer, Barry Buyer here, and Mrs. Barry Buyer, are always going to initial at the bottom right of the document. And I'm going to use the medium initials here. And just the purchase agreement is that way. And it's all the pages. Sometimes purchase agreements are the um, every other page they initial on. But then you pick the document and even the pages that you want those buyer initials to be applied to. Once I click place initials, it's then going to put that 
on every page. So it's a lot easier for me to simply go in and now adjust them instead of dragging and dropping them for each one of the parties. So hopefully that makes sense. The other thing is um, radio buttons. A lot of people don't know what the radio buttons are for, and I love them. Um, if you were sending out a contract asking them, would you like a home warranty or would you not like a home warranty? And you tried to get a hold of them and let's say you were unable to and you just want to get this contract out quickly. Well, here's the key. You can actually choose and I'm trying to find um, this particular agreement right here. So do you want a home warranty? Yes or no. If you were to make that optional, you know what would happen? They'd click yes and no, and now you'd have a contract. Everybody's scratching their head and going, well, what does that mean? So you can actually use the radio buttons, which actually create a choice. Yes, I would, or no, I wouldn't, but it only allows them to pick one of those items. So if they pick yes, the no is grayed out. And if they click no, the yes is grayed out. They can change their mind, but it only lets them choose one, which I love. They also did add an email address that you can have applied um, when they're signing. Of course, auto date, auto time is there too. But basically, you just want to make sure that you have your documents set up where everyone will be signing, everyone will be initialing. And then once you've done that, You've done all of the hard work. We'll just for the sake of time, put it right here. And now we're ready to go ahead and send those out. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit next. Last, would you like to customize the invite? Meaning again, if you have a CC and you wanna put a message, let's pretend that this is to the title company. You could say, uh, and this is a divorce situation. I would like separate closing rooms and only that party is going to get that message. So um, if you, again, are doing a CC to the title company, you can put important information that you may need to relay to them without having to pick up the phone and get a hold of them. However, you can also send it uh, a personalized message to each one of the parties that are signing and only they then see that message. So from here, I'm just gonna go ahead and hit send. I kind of want to show you what those signers are going to see. Again, the email that comes to them is coming from you, the agent, um, so that they recognize it and know that it's okay uh, for them to go ahead and sign that. So I'm going to jump back to my email here. I like to show you what they actually see as your clients because I'm always worried, is it going to be easy enough for them? You know, is it is it going to be a simple enough process? So again, when they get it, it comes from me, Colleen DeLang, their agent. It's going to tell them, you can see my branding appears at the top. It's gonna to tell them that these are documents for e-signature. They're gonna click on the start signing. Of course, your contact information is down below in case they do have a question. What they do need to do is sign that they have accepted that it is a legal binding signature in all 50 states. What this really says is Congress passed two acts, the E-Sign Act and the UTA Compliancy Act, that says as long as it's a traceable signature um, and meets certain requirements, that is legal and binding in all 50 states. Once they do that, they simply hit the start and their signature and initials are then placed in all the appropriate boxes. If they want to reject it for any reason, Again, it will notify you, the agent, with their reason for rejection too. All right, so hopefully that gave you a good uh, bird's eye view into the new Authentic Signs. I'm trying to show it you kind of from the client side and your side as well. If you have questions, uh, Len, you want cheat sheets, right under the MLS documents in Paragon, we created a cheat sheet file. So if you just had some questions on AuthentiSign, you could go right to the cheat sheet file, type in AuthentiSign, and all the AuthentiSign handouts will pop right out for you. Um, that will allow you to print them. Um, that will also allow you to share them or email them. But what we've tried to do is make them very simple. We put large arrows everywhere that you would click for that particular item. We try to make them short and sweet. Um, the ones that we got from Transaction Desk were very long um, and we didn't feel they were that helpful. So we actually rewrote them um, and tried to make them a little bit easier. 
All right. Well, I uh, just want to thank everyone. Thank you, Jeremy, for all of your comments. Thank you, everyone, for attending today. Um, hope you have a great day and happy selling.